Well, good morning. Happy Sunday to you. Today is October 24th, 2021. Today we are going to continue our study of Mark's Gospel. We want to welcome you. We are starting part 19 today. We're going to be talking about the storms of life and the lessons that we can learn from them as we go through them. Hallelujah. So good morning, Sherry. Good morning, Patricia. I just want to welcome everyone as you come on. I know others will be joining in, whether you're live right now or whether you hear this message later in this week or even today. We bless you we welcome you and we're thankful that you are here with us we're thankful that you have ears to hear what the Spirit of God is teaching us through the Holy Spirit and the Word of God the Word of God and the Holy Spirit always agree they never conflict with one another hallelujah so we are thankful we are thankful and we are grateful and we are simply blessed we are blessed by the best we should not claim anything less and we should keep on working on the rest, knowing that God is faithful and he will complete the good work that he began in you and I. Hallelujah. He calls you and I his masterpiece. So let's stop insulting God's masterpiece. Let's stop picking us apart and looking at the flaws. We all have them, but let's not draw attention to them because God designed us. He created us and he called us his masterpiece. That means you. That means you are beautiful. You are cherished. You are loved. You are adored. And you are valued in God's eyes. Maybe not in the world's eyes, but that's not who we're trying to please. We are not striving to please people or the world. We are here to please God. We are here on purpose for a purpose. And I'm thankful that you guys are here with us this morning. Let us go to the Holy Spirit and our Father God through Jesus in prayer as we unite. Father God, I thank you so much for this time that we are in. I thank you, Lord, for technology that allows us to assemble together. I thank you for your word that is forever established in the heavens and it never fades away. I thank you, God, that you teach us lovingly. You correct us when we err and you allow us the opportunity to repent and get back on track with you. Lord, you love us with an everlasting love. You have always loved us. You will never stop loving us. We can never earn your love, and we can never lose your love. God, we are here to worship you, to praise your holy name, to focus on you. Oh, Father, we focus on you, the creator of the heavens and the earth and everything good and perfect that comes down from you in heaven, Lord. We thank you, Lord, that you do have a purpose and a plan for our lives, and you called it good, and it is still good. Even when we have strayed off course, Lord, you will allow us to get back on track with a quick repentance from our heart and a prayer of asking you to forgive us. You are quick to erase all wrongdoing and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness and to make us righteous by the blood of Jesus. Lord, as we share and continue to study the gospel messages, which is the only power from you for salvation. Let it become real and alive to us as your word is real and alive. Let us see truths that you have hidden for us as you reveal them to us. Lord, as we dig into your word, May the entrance of your word bring light as a lamp that illuminates our path. You show us, God, what you want us to learn today. Holy Spirit, as we all are learning to empty ourselves of ourselves, I also right now empty myself of myself. I lay aside every weight, every hindrance, every concern, all my future plans for this week, I lay them aside. And I focus on you as you fill me up from the inside to spill out to the outside. Do the same for every listener today, Lord, so that we can just be so full of your Holy Spirit that we are in tune as one with you. We thank you for teaching us great truths today about the lessons of storms, Lord, that you are always with us. You will never leave us or forsake us. And as we endure through them, 
and stand and being strong in you, Lord. You will help see us through all the way to the other side. Lord, I'm so grateful for your word. I'm so thankful for your strength that you give us. That when we are weak, Lord, you are strong. And as we are completely void of ourselves and only full of you, we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength because we are full of Christ. He dwells in us. We are the vessel. He is the substance that fills us from all to all. So Lord, I just thank you again for loving us, for choosing us, for calling us, and using us for your purpose, Lord. Bless those who hear and do your word, for it's for your purpose, for the kingdom's sake. We are here, and we pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Hallelujah. Well, good morning again. Good morning again. I shared a song. Um, it was like a YouTube link earlier this morning of a song that we're going to be singing at the end because it is also a prayer. Peace be still. As we go through difficult times and difficult seasons, there's all kinds of waves in the ocean that try to pull us under. The enemy wants to trap us and he wants to kill, steal, and destroy us. But God says through Jesus, he's come to give us life more abundant. I want, I want us to have that abundant life. We are not gonna allow the enemy to steal, kill, or destroy us. So we have to say, peace be still to learn to do what jesus is teaching us so we're going to have that song at the very end and we're going to go right into our morning tithe message i like to teach from the word of god so we have godly principles to ordain our steps and also if i can't back up what i'm saying from scripture then it's only my opinion. You could take it with a grain of salt, throw it out. But if I give you scripture references and you can look up the scriptures yourself and validate everything said, then it's God's word. And you have a choice to either trust God and believe it or you don't. That's your choice. But as I sit here and teach and preach, take time to write down the scriptures, the references, and look them up, if not right this moment, then look them up later, because I try and strive to bring glory and honor to God as we teach the word, as we preach the word, so that if it's only my opinion, throw it out. But if it's God's word, take it to heart, study it, read it, and then do it, because we are blessed when we are doers of the word, hallelujah. So I always try to teach from God's word something about tithing because it's something he's told us that we are to do and we are blessed when we do it. It's a spiritual law and God has not said no more. He has never said only do it until, no, he said do it. So we need to do it. Good morning, Jennifer. So we're going to read a little bit and just like jesus teaches through parables and through stories i want to share a story with you and then we're going to tie it in from first chronicles 29 verse 14 first chronicles chapter 29 verse 14 but first i want to read you this story as a parable a father and small son are traveling on a freeway the boy says he's hungry and would love to stop for a snack. They see the golden arches ahead and they pull off the road. But the boy sits at one of the tables in the restaurant and the father returns with a bag full of steamy, fresh french fries. The boy's face brightens with delight. He is hungry. And the father sets the fries before the boy and takes his seat opposite of him. He loves his son, and he loves to watch him eat so heartily. The two sit together at the table while the boy munches away at the snack. And then the dad does what all dads will do. He reaches over, and he takes one french fry for himself. And the little boy snaps at his father, Dad, these are mine. Why don't you get your own? So the dad thinks about this incident on the long silent drive home. He's thinking, 
I gave my son every single French fry that he had, and all I wanted was one. My son doesn't understand something. He doesn't know that I could take all those fries away in an instant. Or if I felt it best for him, I can add to that bag of fries so abundantly that he'd be overwhelmed by them all. He thinks that they are all his. How did he forget so soon who bought them and who brought them to him? Wow, this is a compelling story for any parent because we have all had our hands slapped away from our child's uh, plate when we're reaching out to taste something from their plate. Our kids sometimes act selfishly and they were blind at times to our loving provision and the sacrifices we've made in order to provide for them. But the point is this, God has given you and I our resources and the money that we use. And when he asks for a tithe, many of us figuratively slap God's hands away and we say, hands off my money. But King David's prayer calls us back to the basic truths in 1 Chronicles chapter 29. All things come from thee, O Lord, and of thine own hand we given thee. I want to read 1 Chronicles 29 verse 14 from the message translation. It, it is kind of like a, um, not quite a parable, but it's a paraphrase but it has a good story behind it. It says, but me, who am I? And who are these, my people, that we should presume to be giving something to you? Everything comes from you. All we're doing is giving back what we've been given from your generous hand. As far as you're concerned, God, we're homeless, shiftless wanderers like our ancestors. Our lives, mere shadows, hardly anything to us. God, our God, all these materials, these piles of stuff, for building a house of worship for you, honoring your holy name, it all came from you. It was all yours in the first place. I know, dear God, that you care nothing for the surface. You want us, our true selves. And so I have given from the heart, honestly and happily. And now, see all these people doing the same, giving freely and willingly? What a joy. Oh, God. God of our fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, keep this generous spirit alive forever in these people always. Keep their hearts set firmly in you and give my son Solomon an uncluttered and focused heart so that he can obey what you command, live by your directions and counsel, and carry through with building the temple for which I have provided. This story about the french fries brings that point home are you slapping god's hand away when he says give when he says you are to tithe the first 10 percent of your first fruits we have been studying the parable of the sower we've been studying mark chapter 4 for the last i don't know how many weeks and we learned that there's four types of soil and that only the soil that the seed is sown into of good ground will produce much fruit. Well, if the seed is never sown, no fruit will ever come. We are to sow seed into the kingdom. Matthew 6, says, Seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then all these other things will come to you. What we try to do sometimes is we get it out of order. We try to pay our bills first and buy what we want second. And then if there's anything left over as an afterthought, we say, well, you know what? Maybe I should give some of this to God. That's the wrong priority and the wrong order. God says kingdom first, tithe first, the first of the week. Set aside before you spend anything on anything else. Give to God what belongs to him. Well, it all belongs to God. But he says, give 10%. The remaining 90%, we should always talk to God and ask him for his direction on how to spend it and ask him to bless it. When we're disobedient, we cannot be blessed. We're blessed when we do things God's way. So pinned to the top of our page, we have different ways you can send in your tithe 
as well as your offering gift. You can do it through our website, you can mail a check or money order, you can bring it in person, or you can cash app or Venmo. And as it comes into the kingdom's sake through Restoration Church, we pray over it and we use it in missions to bless people in our local communities, throughout the United States, and in several countries we support in Africa. We are a mission-minded church. Our mission is simple, go ye, love God, and serve people. And that's what we get to do. Now, even though we are an online church, we are also a mobile church. We are mission focused. So we congregate together online from all different areas, different parts of the state, also different parts of the country, and also different parts of the world. We congregate together. We're not able to serve the Lord together in person, but we are serving the Lord together as we are part of the body of Christ. And then as we do mission work together, we have teams and we do work together. And that's part of our fellowship when we're serving God. We have a ministry helping the homeless ministry. We have teams that go out on Saturdays and Tuesdays serving people who are hungry, not just homeless people, but people who are poor. And we also have a thrift store that we serve Monday through Saturday. And we have people coming in, a lot of customers donate, a lot of customers buy from our store, which generates funds to run this ministry and to save for Camp Restoration Center, which will be a 12-month discipleship center. We're excited about that. We also have a benevolent program, so when people come into our store and they truly are in need, we will help them with what they need. God tells us to bear one another's burdens. So when you give your tithe and offerings in to the kingdom's sake through Restoration Church, we use it to bless others, and you're part of that when you give. So, Father God, thank you for those who give, who trust you with their whole heart, and demonstrate it by not holding back from you, Lord, but obediently and cheerfully give the 10% and whatever else they're instructed to give or prompted to give or want to give to you, God. Lord, we thank you for what comes in, and we ask that you multiply it for the kingdom's sake, for your purpose, to reach souls and to make disciples. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah. Well, I thank you all for hanging in there with me. I'm so grateful that you're with us. We're going to go right into the message because we have a lot to uncover and a lot to talk about. We are in Mark chapter 4, and I think this is the last part of our time in Mark chapter 4. We have been studying the whole gospel of Mark. The gospel of Mark is the one, there's four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. For whatever reason, the Holy Spirit hovered in my spirit over Mark chapter four and said, do a study on this gospel. So we are, and we started months ago. Today we start week 19. So we have been studying slowly and thoroughly through the gospels. And for anyone who has joined in, Later into the series, you can go back on our page, go back through our videos, and you can find part one and work your way up to us, okay? But we're glad you're here. Mark chapter four is the parable of the sower, and in it, God said that if we don't understand this parable, we won't understand any of them. So we spent a lot of time studying Mark chapter 4 and the parable of the sowers because there's so much truth hidden in there for us to unpack. And we have spent time unpacking it so we can try to get it in our heart so we can understand the principle behind this because Jesus took time to explain, not just to talk about the parable, but to also explain its meaning. And that's very, very vital to you and I. We have to follow God's instructions. We know as we're getting ready to segue into Mark chapter 5, everything we've learned thus far is building. And Jesus is very, very busy in this time. Now, we know that according to um, Hebrews 13 verse 8, that Jesus Christ is the same yesterday, today, and forever, and he never changes. His word is always true. No matter when you and I read it, it's always true. We also know that Romans 1 16 says that the gospel is the power unto God for salvation. So what we read in the gospel is loaded with power for salvation, which includes healing and deliverance. So 
Jesus is the seed, which is the word that God sown. And we who receive it into good ground of our heart are part of that harvest. And we are to be fruitful and to multiply after our own kind. And our own kind is made in the image of God himself. So you and I have work to do. And we know that as we're wrapping up Mark chapter 4, the next chapter will be Mark chapter 5. And so there's been so much already that we have already unpacked, but we're going to go further today. I want you to open your Bibles to Mark chapter 4 and verse 35. We're back in the Gospel of Mark, and we're learning about what it means to follow Jesus and who we are following. So today we're going to see that the disciples follow Jesus into a storm. And in the storm, they learn some things about Jesus, about themselves, and about the storms we face in life. See, we're going to do the same today. So actually, we're going to read through Mark chapter 4, verses 35 through 41. I'm going to start reading now. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, now remember, this is evening. So all what we have studied leading up to now is all the different things Jesus was busy doing with his disciples in a full day. Now we're at the end of the day and evening has come. As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, let's cross to the other side of the lake." So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind, although other boats tried to follow. But soon a fierce storm came up. High waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, Teacher, don't you care that we are going to drown? And when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, peace, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. And then he asked them, why were you afraid? Do you not have any faith? And the disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey him. Wow. So you and I have something called storm theology. Theology is what you simply believe about God. So storm theology is what you believe about God when storms, tests, and trials come into your life. We all have them. When a crisis comes into our life, is God a good God or is he a bad God? For allowing it to happen? That is a question so many people ask me all the time. If God is a good God, why does he allow these bad things to happen to good people? Have you ever thought that yourself? Have you ever asked that question yourself? When you pray during the storm of life, do you see God as caring or uncaring based on how you think he answers you? Mm. Listen, there's some deep truths here and some hard questions. Storm theology is what you believe about God when things seem to be going, seem to be going horribly wrong. So listen carefully. Storms in life have the ability to bring to the surface what's really deep inside of you. Storms will reveal to you whether you live by fear or whether you live by faith. Storms will reveal to you if your heart is full of trust or if your heart is full of doubt. The way you and I react to God during a storm reveals the truth about ourselves, whether we want it to or not. And we're all there. We all are there. We all have lessons to learn from the storm. Let's dive into this together. Don't get upset. I'm only preaching what God has told me to preach. I'm only going to account it with the word of God. We're going to get to the content of this miracle where Jesus calms the storm. And after sharing some of the Lord's parables, 
Mark now gives us other miracles that demonstrate God's divine power and more evidence that Jesus truly is the Son of God. So Mark is going to show us Jesus' power over nature in Mark 4, 35 through 41. And he's also about to show us in the weeks to come his power over demons, over diseases, and over death. And I can't wait to jump into Mark chapter 5. But we'll get there. We're going to finish this last bit of Mark chapter 4 today. So let's see and look back on the last 18 weeks of study in Mark chapter four. And hopefully we are realizing now how important those weeks were. So we're gonna get started. What will we learn today? Holy Spirit, show us. First of all, we need to understand that storms of life are truly tests of our faith. Storms are tests, write that down. Storms are tests. It's during the storms of life that we discover what we really believe. Storms have a way of revealing the truth about us. In verse four, chapter 4, verse 35, it says, As evening came, Jesus said to his disciples, Let us cross to the other side. So they took Jesus in the boat and they started out leaving the crowds behind. So remember, Jesus gave them instruction and he told them what was going to happen. And when you and I, we need to make a decision to trust God and take him at his word. Jesus said, let us go to the other side. Do we believe that he's going to get us to the other side or not? The storm that's about to happen occurred at the end of the day as evening came. Because it has been a very, very busy day for Jesus. Remember, his day started way on back in Mark chapter 3 and verse 20, where he had a confrontation with some Pharisees. Remember that? Who said that Jesus was possessed by Satan and said that this is where he gets his power to do miracles. They're saying he was possessed by Satan. That's crazy. They also accused him of blasphemy, which was punishable by death. And said there was this fierce adrenaline pumping because of confrontation. It was getting heated. You and I sometimes get in those kind of conversations at times. We don't really like it. But nonetheless, it happens. And then we read that Jesus' brothers came to see him. And they try to take him away because they thought Jesus lost his mind. So now you add to the equation tension he had to endure with his family. Have you ever had tension with your family? It can wear you out. This is all in one day. And then Jesus spent the rest of the day teaching and moving around. He taught crowds and multitudes of peoples, multitudes of people all day long. By the time I'm done this morning preaching, my mouth is going to be sore and dry and I'm tired and this is just an hour and a half. He was doing this all day long. So he taught the crowds and parables openly and then privately he explained them all to his disciples. He taught about the parable of the farmer scattering seed, parable of the lamp, parable of the growing seed, parable of the mustard seed and a host of others. And this continued all throughout the day under the heat of the sun. I'm in a nice, cool, comfortable house with a roof over top. Jesus was doing it outside in the extremities. It had been a very busy day and an emotionally draining day for Jesus. However, for the disciples, they had a front row seat to the teachings about God's kingdom and to the miracles that Jesus had performed. And Jesus had been teaching the disciples with what he said and with what he did, and they always lined up. But now Jesus is giving them a practical test to see how much they've really learned. After all, the hearing of God's word is intended and designed to produce faith. Romans 10, 17, faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. So faith must always be tested. Remember Abraham 
in Genesis chapter 22, when he was asked to give his only son, Isaac, God was testing him to see if he really trusted God or not. And you and I have to go through tests sometimes as well to see if we really, truly trust God or not. None of us are immune to that. Oh, help us, Lord. It's not enough for us to merely learn a lesson or to be able to repeat a teaching. We must also be able to apply what we learn by faith. And that's one reason why God allows trials and difficulties and storms to come into our lives. Storms are the tests and the opportunities for you and I to demonstrate that we do trust in God no matter what. Even when we don't understand the whys, the hows, and what just happened. Most of us are not prepared for the test or the trial to come against us. It usually is a suddenly, like the storm my husband and I went through in 2011, August 27th, with our 16-year-old daughter in the backseat of our van in the midst of a hurricane when a tree fell on top of us and crushed us inside. It was a suddenly, we were traveling, the storm was not expected to come until later that night. It came around 12.15, but the forecast said it would come around 8 o'clock that night. None of us were expecting it. My husband was driving. We did not think as we're driving down the road, suddenly a tree was going to fall and land right on top of us. None of us are expecting. None of us know each second through our life when something is going to happen. We don't. How we respond, when we respond, Will we pass the test? Do we trust God? Even when it's hard, even when it hurts, will we trust God and have faith in him? That's what God wants. He wants us to demonstrate and trust him even when we don't know the answers to all the questions. Only God does, but we still have to trust him even when it hurts. It is going to hurt at times, but we have to trust him nonetheless. See, storms are the test and opportunities for us to demonstrate that we do trust God. So let's look at back in verse 35 and see what Jesus says. He said, let's cross over to the other side of this lake. Literally, I believe Jesus is talking about getting into the boat and going to the other side of the lake. But his statement, when you first hear it, reminds me of the other side of life. On this side of the lake, Jesus had performed miracles. He confronted the Pharisees. He taught about the kingdom of God. And the crowds are growing and growing and growing. And everything's looking good. On this side, the disciples have faith and they trust in Jesus because it had been easy and it's been fun. But on the other side... They are about to get tested. They don't know it, but a storm is coming up on the other side. On this side, things are going well. But on the other side, things are about to get tough. Now, you and I are all going to face storms in our life. Some we have already overcome and some we haven't yet faced. We don't know when they're about to happen. We don't see when they happen. They just happen. So on the other side of good health is illness. There's always two sides of a coin. How are you going to respond if you suddenly get attacked by a bad illness? Your faith is going to be tested on the other side of that illness. The other side of a honeymoon. Well, let me just tell you, our beautiful daughter, Helen Page, is getting ready to get married to the love of her life, Mike Borman, and it's going to take place this coming Saturday, less than a week away. The other side of a honeymoon in some people's lives can be broken relationships. Well, I have to, with my daughter, Helen, she's had prior relationships. They were broken. Well, now we know those relationships were broken because those other guys were not the right men for her. God planned and designed for Mike to be her husband. 
And now she's about to walk down the aisle really soon to marry the love of her life, and we couldn't be happier for her. But there are lessons to be learned from storms of life. She hurt when those past relationships took place, but now she is happy and in love, and God has a plan for all of us. So how will you respond? Your faith is going to be tested on the other side. So you get the idea. Storms are a test. Those tests occur on the other side of life. And as I stated already, lesson number two, storms happen suddenly. Verse 37 of Mark chapter 4 says, But soon a fierce storm came up, high waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. So let's get a clearer picture of what was actually happening here. I'm going to break this down a little bit and give you a little bit of a history. The Sea of Galilee is where this storm took place. It was a somewhat small body of water, about 13 miles wide, 7 miles across, and 150 feet deep. What makes it unusual and sometimes dangerous is that it's about 700 feet below sea level and is surrounded by mountains. So when you have warm air over the lake and cold air that comes over the top of the mountains and down into the lake, cold air and warm air mixes together, you end up with storms. And these storms can develop suddenly within minutes. Did Jesus know that this storm was coming? Absolutely he did. This storm was part of today's lesson for the disciples. Jesus was going to use it to teach them some things about himself and about themselves. Mark describes this event as a fierce storm, so much so that the waves were breaking into the boat and it began to fill with water. As you unpack that in the Greek, it says a storm of hurricane proportions. I know, and my husband knows, what it's like to endure tests of storms related to a hurricane. It's not easy. These were hurricane-like winds. When Matthew described this event, he says a violent storm. You can look that up in Matthew's for a cross-reference. Matthew's chapter 8 and verse 24. But a violent storm arose, and that word violent comes from the Greek word seismo, with which we get our word earthquake or tsunami. For Matthew, it was like the sea was shaking. This fierce and violent storm happened suddenly. And that is, my friends, the way of life. One moment you're doing fine, you're enjoying life, you're driving, you're walking, you're dancing, you're enjoying life, and the very next moment the bottom falls out. Someone runs into you, you get a phone call, you find yourself in the middle of a storm, and everything changes just like that. One minute you're going to the doctor, and next thing you know you get the results of the test and you're hurtled into a storm that you didn't want to be in. One conversation with a friend, and next thing you know you're thrown into the middle of a storm. Look, this is what life is full of. You and I must pass this test. God wants to know when disaster hits you. Will you trust me? What are you going to do? Good morning, good morning. We're studying Mark chapter 4, verse 35 and forward about the storms of life. These storms of life are violent and they're sudden. God does not try to trick us with this. He is not trying to hide something from us. God is always upfront and honest about the storms of life. In Job 14, verse 1, Job was praying to God and he mentioned how life is full of trouble. In John 16, verse 33, Jesus says, Here on earth you will have many trials and sorrows. It's a part of life. We have to know they will happen. You will not escape this life without having some tragedy and some trial and some test come against you. We will be tested. 
But God will never, ever tempt us. Only Satan tempts, but God will test. Storms of life are a reality of life. And storms happen suddenly, and those suddenly tests will reveal your faith and also your spiritual maturity or immaturity. Now, number three, storms can cause you to doubt God. Verse 38, Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? There is a fierce and violent storm occurring. The sea is being shaken. The hurricane-like winds are blowing the boat in all different directions. The waves are crashing in over the boat. The boat is filling up with water. And the disciples, who are, by the way, experienced fishermen, and they're very familiar with this sea they grew up on, are yelling, do this, do that. In other words, they are full of panic. They are thinking they're about to die. And where is Jesus? What? He's sleeping at the back of the boat on a cushion? Whew. Here we see the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus. The humanity of Jesus is seen in the exhaustion of Jesus. That morning, Jesus had to deal with the Pharisees, those religious, stinky thinking people. He taught many parables, dealt with the crowds, dealt with the disciples, dealt with the heat of the sun all day long. And he finally had a chance to sleep and he took it. He was sleeping so hard that this storm didn't even wake him up. He was totally exalted. This is a beautiful picture of the humanity of Jesus. He can relate to what we're going through. He got exhausted. I get exalted sometimes, we all do. But this also is a picture of the deity of Jesus. It shows his power over the storm, his omnipotence and power over nature as the creator of it. So we have this incredible picture of both the humanity of Jesus and the deity of Jesus for all of us to behold. You have God in the flesh, you have the incarnation of God. So we're told the disciples woke up Jesus and they were shouting at him, teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? First of all, their concern about drowning was completely normal and reasonable, was it not? They were professional fishermen and they knew how to handle a boat during a storm, but this storm was fierce and violent and they believed that they were about to die because of it. Have you been there before? Can you relate to these emotions? Or maybe it's somebody you love that the storm was about. And you tap into those emotions and you can kind of sort of understand how these disciples were feeling. But what the disciples did not know is that this storm is going to be used by Jesus to teach them some incredible things about himself and about themselves. This storm had become the real classroom for their spiritual education. It's one thing for you and I to learn something about God or sitting in a church service, but it's another thing altogether to learn something about God and yourself when you lose a loved one or when you're let go at work and you lose your job, when you can't afford to pay your bills anymore or when your health begins to leave you or your loved one, or when your marriage starts falling apart. Some lessons can only be learned in the middle of the storm. We're gonna come back to this question by the disciples in a moment, but just know that the storms of life will cause you sometimes to doubt God. It's pushing you up right into your face. Do I trust God or not? Do I really have faith or am I a person living by fear? The fourth part of this lesson I want you to see is that storms can teach you about God. Verse 39 says, when Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and he said to the waves, silence, 
peace, be still. And suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. The way Jesus rebuked the wind may be an indication of who was behind the storm. I want us to remember in Mark chapter 1, verse 25, there was another time when Jesus gave that same kind of rebuke to a demon. See, it could be that this storm was an attack by the kingdom of darkness to kill Jesus and his disciples. There are cases in the Bible where the devil used weather to bring destruction upon people. For example, in Job 1, verse 16, the devil used a lightning storm to kill Job's sheep and his servants. So we know Satan will use weather to kill, steal, and destroy people. Then in Job 1.19, the devil used a powerful wind to destroy the house that all of Job's children were in that resulted in all of their deaths. That was not God's doing. It was Satan's doing. Remember in John 10.10, the thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. In this life we live, bad things happen because there's evil in this world. God doesn't puppeteer master each one of us. He doesn't control us. He doesn't make us choose the way we're going to walk out this life. He puts before us life and death and he says to choose life, but he doesn't force us to choose life. He gives us free will. He gives all people free will, whether they follow and believe Jesus Christ or not. Because of sin and the sin nature that came through the fall of man with Adam and Eve, there's wickedness in this world. There's evil in this world. And bad things do happen. Sickness and disease happens. We have death to deal with. The wages of sin is death. Because of man's sin, death follows. Praise God, the gift, of, the gift of God is eternal life. So we don't have to stay in death. We can be born again and have eternal life to face, to look forward to. But the wages of sin is death. We know the devil uses storms to kill, steal, and destroy. It's possible that this unexpected storm came right about they were in the middle of the sea was actually an attack by the devil himself. But whether it was from Satan or not, the result was still the same. Suddenly the wind stopped when Jesus told it to, and there was a great calm. Silence, peace be still, he said. And immediately, immediately, the storm obeyed. Jesus had just demonstrated his authority over nature itself. The disciples are beginning to learn more about who this Jesus really is. You and I, we need to learn more about who this Jesus really is. There has never been such display of power before. Listen carefully. When you are in the middle of a storm, there is God right there with you. And he can demonstrate who he is very clearly if he so chooses. There are a lot of lessons we can learn about God in the middle of our storms. He wants us to learn, and he's the best teacher there is. The fifth point I want to make is storms can teach you and I about ourselves. Look in verse 4, chapter 4, verse 40. Then he asked them, why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? That's a question Jesus could be asking you right now if you're going through something. Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? It's a question. I have to ask myself that a lot. When my body starts to respond in the flesh to the circumstances around me, Jesus is asking me, why are you afraid? Don't you have faith? Don't you trust me? I'm sorry, God. I do, I do, I do. We need to get back into the spirit. A fierce storm comes out of nowhere during the night. Jesus was sleeping from exhaustion. The waves start crashing up against the boat. The sea starts pouring into the boat. The disciples have lost control. They begin to fear. When you lose control, fear's the next step. 
when you lose control, fear is the next step. They cannot believe Jesus is sleeping through this. So they go to him shouting at him to wake up. And when he wakes up, they say, don't you care? We're going to drown. How many times have you cried out to God? Don't you care? I can't handle this anymore. We're human. We feel these things. But Jesus right away, instantly rebukes the wind and the waves and they obey. The sea becomes calm like glass. And then Jesus turns and he says that question. I hear him ask me that all the time. Why are you so afraid? Do you not still have no faith? See, their concern about drowning was normal and reasonable. The Lord's rebuke and question about their fear versus their faith is not about their concern of drowning, which was legitimate. The Lord's rebuke is not about their reaction to the storm, but their reaction to Jesus in the storm. They said, teacher, don't you care? They called Jesus teacher, not Lord. Mm, 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 mm. So their understanding of him was not where it needed to be. And instead of saying, Lord, Lord of my life, protector of my soul, instead of addressing him as who he really is, can you help us? They questioned his love and his concern for them. This temptation happens when we become afraid. Because of the storms in our lives, we see God as less than he is, and we doubt his love and care for us. This is exactly where Satan wants us to be. And this is exactly what Satan wants us to do. He wants us to doubt that God loves us and doubt that Jesus cares for us. Fear blinds us to who Jesus really is. Don't let it. Don't let it. You and I will learn things in the middle of the storm. And we will learn where our faith really is and who we truly trust in. All right. Another point. Storms will stretch your faith. Oh my, oh my, is that not a true statement? I have learned, I have learned, I have learned that storms will test your faith. Verse 41, the disciples were absolutely afraid. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and the waves obey. Up to this point, the disciples knew that Jesus was special and unique. And they knew that God was working through him. However, this event started a significant shift in their thinking about who Jesus really is. See, the prophets of the past had performed various miracles like healing the sick, cleansing the leopards, even dividing the Red Sea. But this seemed completely different. This type of power is reserved for God alone. And I'm going to give you a few scriptures, Psalm. 89, actually, let's go ahead and read those real quick. Psalms 89. Hallelujah. Flip your Bible, Psalm 89, verses 8 and 9. O Lord of hosts, who is mighty as you are, O Lord, with your faithfulness all around you, you rule the raging sea, when its waves rise, you still them. Glory to God. Turn over to Psalm 104. Psalm 104, verse 5 through 9. He set the earth on its foundation so that it will never be moved. You covered it with the deep as with a garment. The water stood above the mountains. At your rebuke, they fled. At the sound of your thunder, they took to flight. The mountains rose. The valleys sank down to the place that you appointed for them. You sent a boundary that they may not pass so that they may not cover the earth again. And then turn over to Psalm 106. 106 and verses 8 and 9. 
Yet he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make known his mighty power. He rebuked the Red Sea, and it became dry, and he led them through the deep as through a desert. And then Psalm 107, 107, 23, 107, 23 through 32. Some went down to the sheep, some went down to the sea in ships doing business in the great waters. They saw the deeds of the Lord for his wondrous works in the deep. For he commanded and raised the stormy wind, which lifted up the waves of the sea. They mounted up to heaven. They went down to the depths. Their courage melted away in their evil plight. They wheeled and staggered like drunken men and were at their wits' end. Then they cried to the Lord in their trouble, and he delivered them from their distress. He made the storm be still, and the waves of the sea were hushed. This is the same Jesus. He is the same yesterday, today, and forever. He never changes. He will always calm your storms. He is always there with us, and he will always get you to the other side. If you trust in him, glory to God. They said, who is this man? Here is the reality. We all need to learn from this series, from this particular lesson. <clears throat> you're either heading into a storm or you're in the middle of a storm or you're coming out of one. We have to learn from our storms. God is teaching us something about himself, about us and about the storms of life. We have a storm theology, but we need to refine it, improve it, and use it. The storms of life we need to see as an opportunity for God to display who he is and who we are. When you come out of the storm, you're not going to be the same person that you were when you first entered it. I can guarantee you, on August 26, 2011, and August 28, 2011, there was a pivotal change in our family's life because of August 27, 2011. We are not the same people as we were before then. Each one of us have milestones in our life. Abraham had his massive test of faith when he was asked to sacrifice his son. You may have gone through a massive test of faith yourself. It could have been a loss of a loved one, a child or a parent. It could be something that's physical with a sickness or disease that you're enduring. But we are all going to go through a massive test of faith. And it should be pivotal and marketable where it changes from here to here who we are. We're either going to be exposed of being a person of no faith or is going to reveal the true strength of the Lord that's in us and the massive faith that we truly have. We're going to see Jesus differently and we're going to see ourselves differently. There's some things that you and I can only learn in a storm. So we need to learn from them. Listen, not all storms come up to disrupt our life. Some actually come to clear path. Some storms help us to see some things more clearly. Sometimes it might rise up something in us that we were unaware was deep down inside our spirit and it's garbage and it needs to come up so it can be removed from our heart. Sometimes we have so much fear, doubt, and unbelief in our spirit that is lying there dormant that we're not even aware of until we get shaken up. And when things start shaking up, all that crud that's in there starts to cloud up the water, so to speak. We need it shucking up. We need to get that stuff out of us because it's no good if it stays in us. We think sometimes we're walking in faith, but we realize when we go through a storm how much crud is still in us. That we need to make a decision. Will we walk in faith? Who calms our storm. We need to address the storms of our lives, not just storms caused by weather, 
but storms that are caused by hurts, by choices, and by the actions of others. Such storms exist. They do. And we need to study the word to see how Jesus is not only bigger than any of our storms, but he will help us through these storms. He will help us get to the other side because he promises. Yes, Patricia, in a snap, just like that, it changes us completely. We are not the same when we enter a storm and come out of it. We're not the same. But it shows us if we really, really trust God. There's times when we get hurt. There's times when we don't understand and we won't get the answers right now. But we have to make a decision. Do we really trust God even when it hurts? Even when we don't understand? My answer to that is yes, I do. I don't understand everything. But my trust and my hope is in God. The completed acts of Jesus at the cross. I trust in that. I believe his word is true. I want us to think about this question I'm going to ask you. I just want you to think about it. What is the worst storm you have ever experienced? You don't have to answer it to me. I just want you to think about it. If hard things in life can be thought of as storms, what is the most recent storm you have faced? Maybe for some, it's you've lost your job. Or maybe you went through a divorce. Or maybe you've had a serious, critical accident. Or a disease. Or a loss of a loved one. How did you get through it? Or are you still going through it? Did you have family there by your side? Or friends? Or were you alone? Did you go to a support group? It's okay if you did or are. Did you go through counseling? If so, it's okay. Are you praying still about it? <clears throat> Many times we learn from parents, from teachers and friends how to deal with storms of life. What have they taught you? Did it make a difference? Did they tell you to grin and bear it? Did they tell you don't talk about it or think about it? Did they point you to Jesus? Did they point you to the word of God to be your comfort and your strength? Was there anyone else that could have helped you, but they didn't? Are you upset about that? Have you forgiven them if they should have been there to help you through and they weren't? <laughs> I know what that feels like too. Our family, maybe our best friend or the person we love the most might have been the one who caused the problem. Maybe we have someone who's near and dear to us, a child or a grandchild, and someone else is doing things irresponsibly, causing harm to them. How do we handle that? Do we give it over to God or do we worry and stress and fall apart? We all have things happening to us. Or we all have had things that happen to us. We're not immune. None of us are immune. How do we feel about those people who did bad things to us or people we loved? Or weren't there for us when we needed them to be? Are we angry or abandoned from them? Are we confused about why they wouldn't help us? God will always help us. God will always be there when we need him through the difficult storms of life. He will never leave us or forsake us, but he will permit us to go through these difficult storms of life. Even when we don't understand it, even when it hurts, even when it causes sorrow, he will permit it. He's testing us to see if we will trust him and have faith in him. And he will get us to the other side. Jesus had been teaching the crowds and performing miracles and the disciples had been watching it all. And they witnessed Jesus's great words and deeds. According to Mark, they still don't get it. They say they believe, but how much do they really believe 
and how much they don't quite understand is not completely clear. Jesus and his disciples, as we studied, had a very, very busy, busy day. And Jesus is tired from all the teaching he had done, and he fell asleep in the boat. A storm on the Sea of Galilee was nothing new to those disciples. They were fishermen. They were familiar with the wind and the waves. But this night, in Mark chapter 4, verse 35 and forward, is different than the rest. The storm was fierce, the waves were high, and their fear was great. You and I have been through different storms of life, but every now and then we run slam right into a massive storm that takes our breath away, and it hits us flat on our feet, and we wonder, what just happened? God, where are you? Like these disciples, I hope that we will learn a very important lesson in the face of our storms, to trust in Jesus. How would you feel if you were frantically bailing water and someone was just sitting there doing nothing? Would you be angry? Would you be afraid? Why do you think Jesus was sleeping in the boat? Do you think it had anything to do with the fact that he knew there was nothing to fear? That he knew the wind and the waves were not a real big deal? Maybe a little bit frightening? Maybe not life-threatening? Maybe because he knew he could just say the word and things would settle down? He was going to sleep right through the storm, but why? Because he knew there was nothing to be afraid of. That's what our lives should be like with Jesus in our boat. Being a follower of Jesus doesn't mean that there won't be winds and waves in our lives, but it means that with Jesus, we won't be destroyed by the storms. He needs to be the peace in our lives, which will make these storms settle down and the protection to help us get through them. <sighs> Jesus was right. The disciples, the disciples' faith was very small. But what they did with their small faith was the right thing to do. When they were unsure, when they were afraid, when the storm blew up and threatened them, they still went to Jesus. We too can go to Jesus when we are surrounded by winds and waves. Let Jesus be the one stop that we go to when there's storms of life. Let Jesus be the one we go to to still the waves and let him be the one we go to to be the peace in our life. Oh, Father God, we can't do this by ourselves, Lord. We need you. We know you test us to see if we truly have faith in you, if we're willing to put our personal wants and wishes aside and to surrender everything to your way for you to be the Lord of our life, Lord. We know you do cause us to be tested. The thief comes to kill, steal, and destroy. And you will use these things sometimes, Lord, to demonstrate to us our lack of faith, or our genuine, true faith. Lord, we want to please you. And the only way, according to Hebrews 11, verse 6, is to have faith in you, to believe you, even when we don't understand, even when it hurts, even when it's hard. We trust you, God. Teach us to say, peace, be still. Help us, Lord. We all have flesh. We all have desires that pull us in the wrong direction. But Lord, help us to crucify those and nail them to the cross and to surrender them all to you so that we can walk by faith and by your word, to live by your word, to live morally according to your word in ways that will only bring glory and honor to you, God. 
Lord, I pray right now that if there's anyone who is struggling with the fleshly sin, that they will surrender it to you. Lord, I pray that if there's anyone who has not yet named you as their Lord of their life and Savior, have not repented of their sins and received the free gift of Jesus from God for salvation, that they will do so right now to bow their heads and say this prayer, God, I believe that Jesus is your son, that I am a sinner. And the only way to heaven is through Jesus, through repenting. Lord, I've been trying to be the God of my life and I can't. I can't earn my way to heaven. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. Cleanse me from all unrighteousness. Cover me with your blood. Seal me with the promise of the Holy Spirit. Make me your child as I make you the Lord of my life. In Jesus' name, amen. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Oh, my friends, there's so much we don't understand. There's so much we don't understand. There's tests, there's storms of life. Let's use them to show what's deep down in our heart, to let all that crud in the bottom raise to the top, to skim it off and get it out of us, right? We want to serve God. We want to love God, and we want to pass these tests of life. We're going to go into this song, Peace Be Still, and it's going to be instrumental. <clears throat> As I say all the time, it's not about performance. It's about praising and bringing glory and honor to God. This is a song that is going to be instrumental with Lauren Deagle's instrumentation behind it to peace, be still. This is a prayer that we don't want to be afraid. I posted the song earlier today, this morning. Hallelujah. So hopefully you got the tune and the lyrics. Let me uh, pull it up. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. I don't want to be afraid every time I face the waves. I don't want to be afraid. <clears throat> Thank you, Jesus. For your glory, Lord. to our spirit, church. You pray. These ways are only ways. I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna be afraid. I'm not gonna fear the storm. You are greater than its roar. I'm not gonna fear the storm. No, I'm not gonna fear it all. Rise up in me. 
Let faith rise up, cry of the heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Say that, church. Let faith rise up. Let faith rise up, no heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Yes. Glory. Faith rise up. Jesus, 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 your peace, your peace. Thank you, Jesus. <laughs> Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Peace, rise up, let my heart believe, let faith. Rise up in me. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Let faith rise up, oh heart, believe. Let faith rise up in me. Overflow with your peace, with your presence. Let faith rise up in us. Let your faith of your word rise up in us. Holy Spirit, take over, take over, take over, Lord. We surrender to you, Lord. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. 
Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus, for your peace. Thank you for teaching us, Lord, how to take authority over these things, to command things to obey your word. In Jesus' name. In Jesus' name, Lord, we commit ourselves to you. We thank you for your peace that covers us. We thank you for your blood that covers us. We thank you for forgiving us and cleansing us from all unrighteousness, Lord. Use us, strengthen us. Oh, Father God, walk with us, show us. Let us yield to you completely and forever. In Jesus' name, amen. Church, we love you. We're glad that you joined in today. Have a blessed week.